was wet outside, but nice and dry in here. Good hot coffee. Maker's donuts. <laughs> Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're grateful to you for today. We're grateful that we can be together and study your word together, Lord. We ask that you teach us, Lord, all of us. Teach all of us through your Holy Spirit. Fill us, Lord. We look forward to what you have for us, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Today we're going to talk about a great subject, forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness you know, runs throughout the Bible, uh, and it's a thing that when we think about it should make us so glad uh, because forgiveness is available to us. The modern word gospel comes from the old, old English word Godspell, which is a translation of the Greek word euangelion. And euangelion literally means good message or good news. In Christendom, the gospel refers to the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of which attest to the birth, life, ministry, message, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, all of which is good news to all of mankind because it is through Jesus Christ that we are restored to our former position with God, which was lost in the fall in the garden. Since the fall, the human race has been so keenly aware of our sin, our separation from God, and we have longed for meaning in our lives that was lost in the garden. And we've longed for the depth of relationship with and fellowship with our Creator. The Bible tells us that Adam and Eve walked in the cool of the garden with God. Can you imagine that? And that's what was lost in the fall. We've wanted to be at peace with God and others and ourselves. And yet, despite our striving for it, we found it impossible to find that peace. There's always been an underlying sense that something is not quite right. Philosophers through the ages have thought, written, conjectured, theorized, and spoken on the meaning of life. Is happiness possible? What is the purpose of our existence? They have been motivi motivated by that sense that something is not quite right. And so, exactly what is this good news? Well, the first and most freeing aspect of the gospel is that we are forgiven. That sounds so simple, which is God's way. It is simple, and yet it is one of the most 
sublime truths in all the world. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and have been born again spiritually, as Jesus explained to Nicodemus, then all your sins have been forgiven. Your past sins, whatever your sin is today, and all your future sins have all been forgiven. All of Scripture points to the forgiveness of our sins by God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Even before the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, blood sacrifice was known and practiced by the faithful and devout. We are told in chapter 1, verse 5 of Job, that he sacrificed burnt offerings continually. We talked about Job last month. Job is the oldest book in the Bible. And scholars think that the events that took place in the book of Job were about the same time that Abraham was called by God. So it was a long time before the law, and yet there were burnt offerings being sacrificed to God. Abraham knew of blood sacrifice. As he was instructed by God, to go to a place that God would tell him and offer up his son Isaac. In Egypt, God instructed that when blood was sprinkled over the doors and on the doorposts, the death angel would pass over that house. And so the Passover was instituted and observed by Israel down through the centuries until Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross on the Passover and made available to us his blood to cover the doorway of our hearts and spirits so that we live forever. We are forgiven. Death passes over us. We don't have to suffer daily under the guilt and shame of some past sin or try to rise above ourselves and become a better Christian. It is the father of lies who comes to us and puts thoughts in our heads to try and steal away the freedom Jesus intends for us to enjoy. Jesus said that he came to make us free. Why do we not live that way? Combat Satan's lies that we should go around in sackcloth and ashes all the time with a look on our face that could curdle fresh milk and say, to Satan, I am forgiven, you lying deceiver. The Bible says resist the devil. Resist him like that. Tell him the truth. We are forgiven. Remember when you were a child and had done something wrong and there was this feeling of dread that hung over you. What's going to happen? Am I going to be in trouble? Maybe you felt separation from your parents and you so wanted just to be restored to sweet fellowship. And then all of a sudden, your mother would smile at you and envelop you in her arms. 
and tell you everything was okay. She loved you. And the heaviness and the dread fell away. And you experienced forgiveness. Through the blood of Jesus, forgiveness can be ours every day for all eternity. When we experience forgiveness, the forgiveness that is ours through God, there's a lightness to us, a consciousness of weight being removed. In John Bunyan's seminal work, Pilgrim's Progress, Pilgrim is burdened with a heavy pack that he goes around with until, that is, he's forgiven. And then he's able to take that weight off and he never carries it again. The Bible tells us that Jesus was dining with a Pharisee named Simon. When a woman entered in with an alabaster box of ointment, no words were spoken, but the woman began crying and her tears fell on Jesus' feet. And she washed his feet with the wet of her tears by wiping the tears with her hair. Simon saw all this and thought to himself, if this man, thinking about Jesus, were really a prophet, he would know this woman is a sinner and would not let her touch him. But Jesus then let Simon know that he was much more than just a prophet. With a parable, he said to Simon, there was a creditor with two debtors one who owed 500 pence and the other 50. When they had nothing to pay, the creditor forgave them both. Jesus then asked Simon, which debtor will love the creditor most? Simon said, the one forgiven most. And Jesus said, you are right. In Jesus' day, walking around on dusty roads and streets in sandals made your feet dirty. So the custom was when entering someone's house, they would offer you a pitcher of water to wash your feet. Jesus said to Simon, When I came in, you offered me no water with which to wash my feet. But since she came in, she has not stopped washing my feet with her tears. You, Simon, offered me no kiss of greeting, but she has continually kissed my feet. You, Simon, did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Then Jesus said to Simon in Luke chapter 7, verse 47, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Now remember, Jesus said that to Simon not to the woman. So what is it that Jesus wants Simon to see? 
Why did Jesus give Simon the parable? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Jesus is always speaking to our hearts. Jesus could see into Simon's heart and knew that Simon did not really consider himself a sinner. When the woman came in and shed tears on Jesus' feet and touched him, Simon's first thoughts were about how bad a sinner the woman was and how little Jesus really knew. Simon judged Jesus for letting the woman touch him. We, I know I am way too often, just like Simon. I always want to look at the sin of others, the shortcomings of others. And we try to balance their sin against our own. And when we do that, we somehow always manage to make ourselves look better than others, at least in our own eyes. Jesus was trying to get Simon to see that even in forgiveness, if Simon did not see himself as a sinner, he would not experience the release, the freedom that God's forgiveness is intended to impart to us because Simon didn't really think he needed much forgiveness. On the other hand, in verses 48 and 50, Jesus says to the woman, Thy sins are forgiven. Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. She was keenly aware of her sin. She was broken over her sin. So when Jesus pronounced her sins forgiven, the weight of the world was lifted off her shoulders. She came in crying and sobbing because the weight of her sin crushed her. And she knew from trying that there was nothing that she could do to free herself. But she had heard of Jesus and truly believed that He could unburden her. She left Simon's house with these words, Go in peace. The woman found what she was looking for, longing for, what the world has always been looking for and longing for since the fall in the Garden of Eden. Peace. The peace of knowing forgiveness. Her peace was great because it was measured by the degree of what was forgiven. She did not balance her sin against others. She saw herself against the backdrop of God's purity and righteousness. And like Job, abhorred herself. So when Jesus said she was forgiven, her love for him was so overwhelming because she knew the degree of her forgiveness. Remember what Jesus said to Simon. 
But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. The parable was just that, a story to get Simon and all of us to see that when we are forgiven by God, we are forgiven totally, 100%. In contrasting the debtors, one who owed 50 pence and the other 500 pence, Jesus was not saying some people sin less and some more. He was saying, if you see yourself as owing less, as not really being the wretch that you are in the eyes of a holy God, then when forgiveness comes to you, you will loveth little. You will not experience the overwhelming release and freedom that God wants you to have if you cannot admit how bad you are. Don't ever compare your sins with the sins of others. Compare your sin with God's standard. If you have broken the law, then that is the kind of sinner you are. It's that simple. And Jesus, who we have seen, does not focus on the outward, but on the intents of our heart, refined the law to the thoughts and intents of the heart. He said to us, if a man looks on a woman with lust in his heart, he has already committed fornication and adultery. If we are angry with another, then we have committed murder in our heart. The law was given so that we could see our desperate need of forgiveness. Without it, we are condemned by the law. We are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, that the law killeth. The law does not offer forgiveness. It shows us our need of forgiveness. We are told to judge ourselves rather than others, and the standard against which we should judge is God's standard. Then we can see what great sinners we truly are. Then we can experience forgiveness that truly makes us free, that gives us the peace in our innermost hearts and souls that God intended for us from the very beginning and that fills us with love for the God who has so greatly forgiven us. So we see that we can know God's forgiveness for us to the same extent of our awareness of our sin. But another crucial aspect of forgiveness in the Bible is forgiving others. I don't know about you, but that has always been one of the hardest things for me to do. I always thought, well, for many years I thought I was forgiving. And I was surprised when God finally pulled back the veil and showed me that I was really bad about holding a grudge. Oh, I might have spoken the words, yes, I forgive you. 
But my heart was holding back. And what I really meant was, I'll never forget what you did to hurt me. And you won't get another chance because I am emotionally withdrawing myself from you. And in my mind, that feeling was justified. And not only that, I thought that was the better part of wisdom. Somebody's wrongfully betrayed me, hurt me. Doesn't make sense for me to just let it go. I told myself it's one thing to forgive, but it's another to be foolish and put myself in the position of being hurt again. The Bible doesn't tell us to be foolish. But it does say that withholding forgiveness will have some really negative effects on us. Withholding forgive, forgiveness from others is all too easy, especially when we have been betrayed by someone we trusted. Jesus was betrayed by his own. Judas was with him from the beginning. Peter said to him, Lord, I'll go to prison. I'll die for you. And then the night that Jesus was taken, three times denied that he even knew him. The same ones who celebrated his glorious entrance into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey a week before, shouting, Hosanna, were the same ones who cried out, crucify him. It was the leaders of the Jewish religion that conspired to kill him. The very ones who should have been able to so clearly see who he was, that he was the fulfillment of all prophecy. And yet, from the cross, Jesus was already interceding on our behalf by saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he has continued to this day interceding on our behalf with our Father in heaven. It could be just that way with us, that the one who offends us is a good friend, a spouse, a family member, someone that is supposed to be loyal and faithful to us. So that when they cause us pain, our sense of justice says, they need to suffer for what they did to me. That so-called sense of justice is actually the devil, again, the father of lies, who knows this truth. Forgive and you will be forgiven. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. It's in Luke. Chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. Forgive and you will be forgiven. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Satan doesn't want you to forgive others. Because he knows that will allow you to experience complete Forgiveness. 
just as we saw earlier, that the degree of forgiveness we experience is equal to the degree in which we agree with God about the depth of our sin. So it is in forgiving others. The, the degree to which we truly forgive another is the measuring stick that will be used to determine the freedom we experience by forgiving another. Now this doesn't mean if we don't forgive someone, God will not forgive us. We know that God's forgiveness is not dependent on us, but is completely based on what was accomplished on the cross. The degree to which we are able to experience that forgiveness, however, is measured by what we view as having been forgiven. By the same token, when we hold a grudge against another person, when we don't truly forgive them, we can't be free. We're a prisoner of our own lack of forgiveness. Have you ever known a bitter and unforgiving person? It's frightful, really. The bitterness can be seen on a person's face, especially if they've held on to a grudge or bitterness for years. Wrinkles caused by the strain of having to maintain a grievance for a long period of time, often for many years. The Bible says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. It's Hebrews verse, chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. Unforgiveness can become such a root of bitterness. If we are quick to forgive and don't allow bitterness to take root, then obviously that's a good thing. <laughs> but have you ever tried to dig up a root that's deep in the ground that's been growing for a long time? Prepare for calloused and bloody hands because that root does not want to be gotten rid of. A 2011 clinical study at Concordia University found that holding on to bitterness can affect your metabolism, immune response, and organ function and lead to physical disease. The Bible came to that conclusion a long time before that study at Concordia University. In Proverbs 17, verse 22, it says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. So it is with a root of bitterness that inevitably grows from unforgiveness. But all of that bitterness will fade away with forgiveness. Forgiveness is the cure. Just as forgiveness from God frees us, so does our forgiveness of others free us. 
Many of you probably know about uh, Corey Ten Boom. She was arrested in Holland along with her father and sister for hiding Jews during the Nazi occupation in World War II. Her father died in prison 10 days later, and eventually Corey and her sister Betsy were sent to Ravensbrück, a women's concentration camp in Germany. While there, they held prayer services and Bible studies in their barracks. Betsy became progressively weaker and sicker and one day was mercilessly beaten by a guard because she could not work. She died a short time later in the sick ward at Ravensbrook. Twelve days later, Corey Ten Boom was called to the main office and released. She later discovered that the reason she was released was because of a clerical error. And a week later, all of the women in her age group at Ravensbrook were killed in the gas chamber. Corey Ten Boom wrote a best-selling book called The Hiding Place that told about she and her family hiding Jews in their home who were being looked for by the Nazis. That book was later made into a movie. She traveled the world as an evangelist sharing her story of Christian love and the power of healing available from God. One day in 1947, after speaking to a large group in Munich, she noticed a man walking toward her and suddenly realized that he was one of the most cruel, ruthless guards at Ravensbrück Prison. The man walked up to her, identified himself as a guard from Ravensbrück, said he had become a Christian and was there to ask her to forgive him. He told her that he had prayed to God that he might be able to gain forgiveness from at least one person who had been a prisoner at Ravensbrook before he died. And the man extended his hand Corey Ten Boom said in that moment, she could not imagine forgiving this man. Could this man erase Betsy's slow, terrible death just by asking? As she wrestled with what to do, she did not think of forgiveness as an emotion, but as an act of the will. She thought to herself, I can't forgive him. I can only hate him. And at that moment, she said, The verse in Romans chapter 5, verse 5 came to her that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. 
And she prayed, Lord Jesus, I can't do this. Jesus, do this through me. I can raise my arm, but you must do this through me. She thrust out her hand and described a feeling of like an electric current going from her shoulder to her hand, grasping the former guard's hand. She said, and a healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. And she said she had never known God's love so intensely as she did at that moment. But even so, I realized that it was not my love. I had tried and did not have the power to forgive this man. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. And that was only two years after the war ended. It was after that that Corey Ten Boom's worldwide ministry gained momentum, that her book was written and became a bestseller, that the movie was made, that she was blessed with her heart's desire, what she and her sister Betsy had talked about. A worldwide audience for the gospel. That love that Corey Ten Boom experienced at the moment that she forgave. Is it not exactly what Jesus spoke of to Simon when he said, But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Corey Ten Boom experienced the love of God in the same degree as the forgiveness she extended to the guard. She exchanged her inability to humanly forgive for God's divine ability to forgive through her. This is the exchanged life. It would have been easy, justified even in the eyes of the world, for Corey Ten Boom to have withheld forgiveness from the guard. But if she had, she would not have been able to spread the love of God and tell people around the world of his miraculous forgiveness. Now let's talk about the nature of forgiveness for just a moment. There is a tendency in us, I know I'm like this, to treat something that we didn't pay for as cheap. It doesn't matter if the thing is extremely valuable or not. It's just if, if it cost us nothing then it's easier to take it for granted. Forgiveness is the same. Forgiveness comes to us by grace. It is the free gift of God given to us. But while it is free to us, it was purchased for us by the suffering and death and shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the parables about the debtors are so appropriate. Jesus paid our debt for us. The law could not save us. 
but the grace of God did. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, that God canceled the record of debt that stood against us by nailing it to the cross. Why did Jesus have to die to pay our debt? Romans 6.23 tells us why. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. As sinners, death was what? was required of us. But Jesus died for us in our place and we are set free from that debt forever. But always remember the debt was not forgiven. We are forgiven the debt. But the debt was paid by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Don't hang on to unforgiveness. It will separate you from the love of God because you'll be focused on that which you cannot forgive. No one can love without forgiving. And no one can forgive without loving. And no one can love without the Holy Spirit of God living in them. Now the last thing about forgiveness is forgiving yourself. When we really mess things up in our lives by sinning, the first place we need to go is to God. Maybe my favorite verse in the Bible is 1 John 1, 9, which says, But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. That is the vertical that we talked about last month. If you weren't here last month, we talked about the vertical and the horizontal. And always the vertical first, looking up to God. The horizontal is looking around at our circumstances and people. If that's the first place we look, then we're in trouble. But go to God. Remember always the vertical first. So if God is faithful and just to forgive us, who are we to not forgive ourselves? Does it not sound prideful and presumptuous to say, well, God has forgiven me, but I'm not going to forgive myself? That's because it is prideful and presumptuous not to forgive yourself. In confession to Him, there is forgiveness from God. Then there comes the horizontal, humbly asking forgiveness from whomever we have hurt through our sin. They may forgive us or they may not. But it is only our obligation to ask. As we have seen from what we've talked about earlier this morning, if the person forgives you, then they will be set free and are not tied to you by resentment and the risk that they will become bitter 
If they do not forgive you, then pray for them. Because, as we have seen, they will be unable to enjoy the forgiveness that is rightfully theirs if they are born again. Forgiveness is a precious gift that God has given to us if we are covered by the blood. When Jesus says, I came that you might be free, I came to set you free, he meant it. That's how he intends for us to live, is free. Forgiveness from God is what makes us free. What it means to us is incalculable. In the Psalms, there are many places where a verse will end, Selah, which means pause and consider. It is a good thing for us to pause and consider what the forgiveness of God means to us and for us and to show us and remind us that we are created in the image of God. He has bestowed on us the precious ability to forgive others just as He has forgiven us. Let us use that blessed gift as often as we are presented the opportunity. It will result in blessings being poured out on the forgiven and the one who forgives. Now let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the forgiveness that it is ours through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he accomplished once and for all on the cross when he laid down his life for us and shed his blood for us that we could be forgiven forever. Now let us walk in that, Father, knowing that we are forgiven, claiming that, never doubting that, and desiring to forgive others because of the freedom that it gives to us and to them. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.